Hi, hello. Here we are to discuss the fundamentals of rotational spectroscopy. We have got the potential energy diagrams for a molecule in the ground and excited states here. And let's look at the ground state only here. Within the given electronic level, we have got several vibrational levels and the vibrational levels are characterized by several rotational levels inside. So, the energy difference between these rotational levels corresponds to the energy of microwave radiations in the electromagnetic spectrum. Microwave radiations belong to the lower energy region and with a wavelength of several millimeters up to a meter. Rotation of a molecule is associated with energies corresponding to microwave radiation though for rotational spectroscopy and microwave spectroscopy are synonymous terms. A rotating molecule is assumed to be a rigid rotor. Why the assumption is because the approach of quantum mechanics to study a complicated system was to simplify the system by applying certain assumptions and understand the simplified system and these understandings are now extrapolated to the complicated system. That is what the modus operandi for quantum mechanics. So, Let's now look at our rotating molecule as a rigid rotor. A rigid rotor is one which does not change the distances during rotation. That is in our case the distance between atoms and bonds and bond length. The bond lengths are not affected by rotation. For example when this is rotating the bonds are kept stiff and the rotation generates a torque and the, ro the molecule rotates with an angular velocity omega and the resultant angular momentum is created which is i omega where i is the moment of inertia the sum of m r square terms m is the masses of the atoms and r would be the bond length we will see the details soon so when a molecule rotates about different axes like this different moments of inertia are associated and based on the relation between these moments of inertia about different axes, we have got four classification of molecule, linear, spherical tops, symmetric tops and asymmetric tops. Among those, the spherical tops are the most symmetric ones with all the moments of inertia equal whereas the asymmetric top are the most asymmetric ones with all the moments of inertia different from each other. And now let's see our simplest case of rigid rotor diatomic molecules and diatomic molecules are of two types homonuclear diatomic molecule and heteronuclear ones let's look at homonuclear diatomic molecules these are non-polar molecules with zero dipole moment and during rotation also they do not generate a change in dipole moment that means there is no electric field variation during the rotation so these molecules cannot interact with the electric field component of the electromagnetic spectrum therefore such molecules will not give rise to microwave spectrum or rotational spectrum on the other hand, a heteronuclear diatomic molecule like this is polar already and their polarity or dipole moment also change during the rotation. As the direction of rotation changes or the alignment of molecules during rotation changes, you get the direction of dipole oriented differently. So you get a change in dipole moment like a sine wave. So this wave-like variation of the electric field of the molecule can interact with the electric field component of the electromagnetic spectrum and this interaction causes the absorption of certain energy of the electromagnetic spectrum that is in the microwave region here give rise to a microwave spectrum. A rigid rotor looks like this with masses m1 and m2 attached and they are separated by a distance r0 this is our bond length and the molecule rotates about an axis passing through the center of mass and the distance from the center of mass to the mass m1 is r1 and the distance from the center of mass to the mass m2 is r2. So we have got the sum r1 plus r2 gives the r0 the bond length. And now let's have this definition for center of mass that is m1 r1 values are equal and before by rearranging the equation you are reaching here for the R1 value in terms of R0 and M1 and M2 the masses and similarly you get R2 the second distance also in terms of the two masses and the distance R0 and by definition moment of inertia is sigma MR, MR square terms and so you replace here R1 and R2 values to I value and here in the end after rearrangement you reach this expression 
or the term in the parenthesis that is the mass combinations are replaced with mu which is the reduced mass. So you reach that moment of inertia I of a molecule is mu r0 square r0 is the bond length and mu the reduced mass m1 m2 by m1 plus m2 and it is important to have this expression in mind and now let's see that angular momentum j will be i omega as we have seen before and therefore energy is related to angular momentum as like this and if you saw the hamiltonian expression for this energy we are not going to the depth of the operation but the operation in the end gives the value for energy in terms of j the rotational quantum number and h the Planck's constant c the velocity of light in vacuum the constant and i the moment of inertia this term in green here is a constant for a molecule and this is called rotational constant b of the molecule and the energy of the rotating molecule can therefore be given in terms of rotational constant and the rotational quantum level in which the molecule is rotating and so we have good for several j values you can calculate the energy values for j equals 0 you get energy also 0 and for j equals 1 you have got energy 2b and successively 6b 12b etc and now let's look at the quantum mechanical selection rules the selection rules are criterions or conditions which help us to understand whether a molecule is rotationally active or whether a molecule absorbs microwave radiation during rotation or not and if it absorbs whichever transitions are permitted. So let's see the gross selection rule which says the general character of a molecule which makes it rotationally active. So here as we have seen before permanent dipole moment is an important criteria so the gross selection rule would be the molecule should have a permanent dipole moment. As we have seen before, a homonuclear diatomic molecule is rotationally inactive whereas a heteronuclear diatomic molecule is rotationally active. And coming to the specific selection rule, whichever energy transitions are permitted. Here, the rotational transitions corresponding to a change in rotational level delta J of unity is allowed and the positive sign indicates absorption and negative indicates emission. So, in our case of absorption spectrum, we have delta J should be plus 1 that is from the level J equal to 0, it can move up to J equal to 1 giving rise to an energy difference of 2B as calculated here and so the first spectral line will be at a position 2B and the second line that is transition from J equal to 1 to 2 corresponds to energy difference 4B to give a resultant line, spectral line at position 4b and the next transition would be of 6b units of energy so you get the next line at 6b and then 8b etc. So the most important information we have here is that the first spectral line occur at 2b and the successive lines at 4b, 6b etc. So, if you look at the distance or the separation between the two adjacent lines in the spectrum would be 2B units. So, this information helps us to understand the identity of a molecule like this. Here we have got an example spectrum of hydrogen chloride and the adjacent peaks are separated by 2B units we know and 2B in this case is 21.2 cm inverse. From this 2B value you get the rotational constant B and B involve the term I, the moment of inertia which is expressed in masses and the bond length. So if we get the B value from the spectrum you can reach the bond length or masses if one is known. This is how the rotational spectrum help us to reveal the unknown identity of a molecule. And now let's see how to distinguish the isotopes using this spectrum. Here hydrogen chloride has got two isotopes of chlorine and so you can distinguish between the two isotopes because in this first case of H37Cl 
your masses are 1 and 37 whereas here your masses are 1 and 35 so this will be reflected in your moment of inertia i because i is a combination of masses so it will be reflected in the rotational constant b and therefore in energy differences that's why you get the differences in spectra because of the presence of isotopes so you can detect the presence of isotopes and the isotopic abundance even from the rotational spectra so far we have seen the case of rigid rotors but we know that our molecules are non-rigid rotors. This is our understanding so far that the bond length does not change during rotation but in reality the bond length of the molecule, the distance between the two atoms change during rotation. That means a rotating molecule is at the same time vibrating also. The bond is stretching and get compressed. And so how does this affect our calculation of energy? That's what we are going to see now. So a non-rigid rotor, the real molecule, when it rotates, its velocity is influenced by the bond length. When the molecule is in the compressed state, when the distance is low, the molecule rotates with a low velocity. Whereas when the molecule is stretched, when the distance is large, the molecule rotates with a high velocity. So the angular velocity of the molecule is low when the atoms are close to each other and high when they are far away from each other. So this affects our rotational constant. We know this expression and if you replace I in terms of reduced mass and R, we can see the rotational constant is inversely proportional to the distance, the bond length. So when the molecule is stretched, the rotational constant is decreased and when the molecule is compressed, the rotational constant increases. And here is the energy expression for a non-rigid rotor, a vibrating rotor where we have got a new term involving the constant d, the distortion coefficient or stiffness constant. And let's now see the difference in our energy calculations for a rigid rotor and a non-rigid rotor. The non-rigid rotor involves this additional term. So the non-rigid rotor energy is less by this term dj square j plus 1 squared. So the first energy level j equal to 0 would be the same because that would give you 0 rotational energy and the second level for the non-rigid rotor will be less by this term than that of the rigid rotor. So the second level of the non-rigid rotor is placed a bit lower to the rigid rotor and the third level would be even lower because as you move on higher and higher j value the second term becomes stronger and stronger because it is the squared term here. So for higher and higher j values the energy levels are more and more lowered than the rigid counterpart. So the spectral lines would also be shifted to lower values than in the rigid rotor assumption. And here is an example. We have got in the purple color an experimental spectrum of hydrogen chloride whereas the blue one is the calculated spectrum based on the assumption that the molecule is a rigid rotor. So the real case the non-rigid rotor is slightly shifted from the calculated rigid rotor assumption. So in reality our molecules are non-rigid rotors but we started with the assumption of a rigid rotor as quantum mechanics always do and our knowledge of energy expression, our knowledge on rotational constant, the knowledge on moment of inertia we just extrapolated to non-rigid rotor and so now we know how to use the rotational spectrum to understand the unknown identity of a molecule to have masses if you know the bone length or to have bone length if you know the masses etc. Now let's see how a microwave spectrometer looks like. Thanks to the NCL web page for the picture. The most important components involve microwave source and the microwave radiations are then passing through a wave guide and then to the sample cell where the sample material is kept. Sample absorbs that particular components of the microwave radiation according to the energy transitions happening inside and the transmitted lines are then passed through the modulator and then through the detector and at the end at the analysis unit with the help of a computer you can process the data to get a spectra. That's how the microwave spectrometer works and 
The most important applications lie in calculating the bone length or the masses, the atomic masses if you know the bone length and isotopic abundance we have seen this and it can be used for temperature studies and this tool has got exclusive applications in astrophysics. A large number of gases, interstellar gases were identified by using microwave or rotational spectrometers. And the method is non-invasive, non-destructive and it works for solid liquids and gases and for dark colored samples and for any sample volume it can work with small amount of sample and large amount of sample. So these are some of the advantages of microwave spectroscopy. So here we stop and in the next session we will be seeing vibrational spectroscopy. Thank you.